Okay, um, I'm going to start. Um, first of all, thanks everyone for coming uh, to this talk on using Git as a NoSQL DB. Uh, I know there's like a lot of other talks going on that are uh, done by very smart people with um, things that make a lot of sense and you guys chose to come to the crazy talk, so thanks for that. Um, and when I talk about using Git as a NoSQL DB, the first question I really get is why? Why would you do that? So, to give you a bit of background, I work at a company called Epi Parking, and what we do is we digitize all the roadside markings. So that means like every line on the road, every parking sign there is, all the rules, all the restrictions, and then we put that into an app and now also into connected vehicles. Now the problem is that all of that data is not readily structured, so. What we get is essentially CSV files, Excel files, plain text files, shape files, any data that you can imagine, and then we put it into our system. Now the problem is, because these are like massive files, you can't really know whether that data is actually correct, and to view it, you have to put it into your application. But then when it's inside your database, well, you know, how do you get it back out? So. One thing that people usually say is like, oh yeah, you have like a version number on your row and then you can revert. What we actually need is like going back a complete version of like the whole database. So in the beginning what we did is do rollbacks, have a backup for your database, import and then roll back. Now that takes quite a bit of time. Um, so we started building like a system on top of um, Azure table storage and Azure uh, blob storage to then be able to revert that. But it became very complex very quickly. And we noticed that, well, what we actually need is something like Git, where you can do like a rollback in seconds and then do a roll forward. And on top of that, you can create branches where you can do an experiment with your data. So that's when we started looking into Git. And obviously, the first thought we had was like, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? And we started building on top of it, and we noticed that it was actually possible. So I want to stru structure this talk into three bits. Um, first is the mechanics of Git as a database, so how do you actually use it as a DB. Then I want to talk about you know, what the advantages are and why it's really a good idea. And then lastly, why it's a terrible idea and you should probably just forget about everything I said previously. So first a few disclaimers. Um, in this talk, when I talk about a database, I'm not necessarily talking about SQL or Oracle or any of these like big databases. I'm talking about anything that is structured data held in a PC or in a data store. And the second term is NoSQL. NoSQL is a very overloaded term. But in the context of this talk, I just want to talk about it being schemaless and non-relational. So let's get started. So what was the first attempt that we did and failed miserably? So you could simply create a new Git database, uh, a new Git repository, create a JSON file, save it into one.json, add it and commit it, and then you can get it back out. Cool. So now you have a database. What you actually have is just a file system with Git on top of it. What are the problems with this? Well, if I want to write to multiple branches at the same time, how do I do that? That means that every time before I write, I first have to check out my directory, save the file, and then go back to the other branch. So that works if you have like one dot JSON, but if you have like 10 million dot JSON, then you start getting into a problem because every write is like switching between these branches. On top of that, you also have all of your data duplicated because you have the various different directories. And next, you're actually writing twice because first you're writing to the file system and then you're writing to the Git database. So that doesn't work. So let's go back a bit and talk about how a Git repository looks. So on the client side, we usually have like our checked out directory where we have all our files and then you have the .git folder. So this is what we know from code. And then on the server side, we have what is called a bare repo. So that's essentially everything that's inside that Git folder 
but just that, and we don't have the actual files. Because that git folder contains all of your files and all of the version history of those files. So in theory, we could do with only the right side um, that is shown here. So let's look at the Git data model, and we'll start with um, what's probably familiar to those who've worked with Git. On the top, we have the branches. So a branch is nothing more than a reference to a commit, and this then has relations to commits that came before. So that's how Git builds up the historical model, by um, having a relationship between all the commits. Now, this is what we see as programmers. So that's the top level, and we work with that constantly. What we probably don't see is what's underneath that. So a commit essentially points at a base tree. And you can look at that as your, your base folder, your root folder. That's your top tree. And then underneath that, you have blobs, which we can look at as files, or other trees. So every commit points to a new tree object that represents your data um, and then all the files underneath. And Git consists actually of two databases. So on the top part, we have what is called the reference database. And on the bottom part, we have the object database. So the reference database is a very small, very simple database, which has mutable structures. So you can change master you know, by just updating the commit it points to. And on the bottom, the object database is actually an immutable store. That means that you can only write to it. Once you've written a tree, you can never modify that tree anymore. So it stays always there. And that's how Git keeps track of all of your history by never changing anything and just adding on top of it. The Git toolset consists of two types of commands. Um, you have the top level commands, the porcelain commands. And if you look at those and you work with Git either on the command line or through UI tools, you'll probably be familiar with a lot of these like a git commit, git merge, rebase, pushing, pulling. So those are all like top level commands of Git. Underneath that are what's called the plumbing commands. And the plumbing commands is what Git uses um, to actually write the files into the database to make sure that you restore the correct files. And they compose those to build the high-level porcelain commands. So we're going to have to use the plumbing if we want to really work with Git as a database. So let's start with the lowest level. So the first thing we want to do is save a file. So normally you do that by saving a file in the file system and then telling Git to add it to its database. Now we want to skip that step of writing a file and we want to write directly to Git's database. So the way we do that is by echoing a JSON file and putting that into Git hash object. And that gives you back a hash. And this hash will always be the same because it's built based on the content. So if you run this on a different PC, you will get the same hash back. Now, I can read that file back out by passing in the hash or the short version of that hash, and it will give me back the JSON. So now I have a key value store. I can put in a value, gives me back a key, and then I can later retrieve that um, by that key. Now, the problem is that when I change that file later, I'll get a different key. So as a key value store, that's quite a uh, lousy solution because my keys keep on changing. So I'll need to go to the next level, to the trees. And I need to write a tree, which is a bit of an obscure command, but I'll tell git to update an index. I pass it the hash of the file that I want to put in there, and I give it a file name, one.json. And then I write that tree into my database. That gives me back another tree, which has a hash and a pointer to my blob. So again, I can get that back, and I will receive uh, the contents of the tree. And then I can see what the hash is and then retrieve the file again. 
Now the problem is when I change the file, the hash of the file changes, I need to change the tree again, and I'm in essentially in the same situation I was before. So next level up, commits. So how do I create a commit? I echo a commit message and then pass that into commit tree. And I pass in the tree that I want to commit. And that then gives me back the commit hash, which you've seen uh, either in UI tools or on the command line. This is that same uh, commit hash. So at this moment, I have a commit which points to a tree with one file. Um, if you look at this in a normal Git repo, it would just be one.json with a commit message. I can do a git log on that, and then you'll see that I have indeed added one file with that commit message that I gave it. And now I can say, like, for this commit, give me the contents of one.json, and git will run through the entire hierarchy and give me back the contents. Now, how do I update it? Um, you would say that I would update that blob, and then everything updates itself. That's not the case with Git. Like I said before, anything below the, uh, the commits, the trees, and the blobs are all immutable, so I can't change them. So how do I do that? Well, again, I'm going to just echo a new item, a new blob, with an updated name. I get back the hash, write a new tree, and then I create a new commit. Now what's different with before is that I pass in the dash p parameter and say like this is the previous one. So now it creates a new commit, but pointing at the new tree that I created, but also pointing at the older commit. And that's the way that Git can keep track of those files, because it now sees a tree that points at one.json, where it before had a tree that pointed at a different one.json. So that's the way it can do diffs. Now I can do a log again on that last one. And you can see that I have two commit messages with twice the file uh, one.json that was added or changed. With the new commit, I can now do a git show. And I get my updated content. I can still get to my older version by just doing a git show of the previous commit and get the original content. Yeah. So if I do this um, as a database, that means that every write, I can go back to what the previous version was. Now we're still not there because I still need to remember which one was the last commit. So the way we do that is by creating a branch. And I could do this through the porcelain commands or through the um, plumbing commands, which is just git update ref, and I tell it to point master at that last uh, commit that I have. So I've got there 991, and I just pointed at that. And now I can simply do git show master of 1.json, and I get the updated file. So that's all nice, but you know these are all shell commands. So what am I supposed to do? Like go out to the shell every time when I'm when I'm uh, creating data. So there is um, something called libgit2, and essentially that's a C implementation of all the Git tooling. Now I'm not a C programmer. I'm a C sharp dev, so I like to do that in C sharp. And then there is a library called libgit2 sharp, and that provides bindings on top of uh, libgit2. There's also bindings for any other language, uh, on Java, on Node, um, and a whole bunch of other ones. So if you want to access that, you can do it uh, using these bindings. So I'm going to show now how you would do this in C-sharp. Um, it's very similar to how you would do it in Java or Node. So it's just showing you a bit the flow of that. So for a database, a key value store, what do we need? A get and a save. So I want to save something, giving it a key and a value. And then given that key, I want to get the value back out. With git, I need one extra thing, and that's which branch I want to save it onto. So the first thing I'm going to do is initialize a bare repository. So using libgit to sharp, that's simply passing in 
is bare equals true. And now I can start writing my blob. So as before, I first need to write that blob. And there's a bit more infrastructure code here. I'm taking a, an object of t and then serializing it into a JSON and putting it into a memory stream. And then I can create a blob and that will give me back a blob object which essentially has the SHA and some other properties. So next step is creating a tree. I get the current uh, commit and then I get the tree that that current commit is pointing at and I add to that that one.json file and then I create it. So again, it gives me back a tree with the hash and everything on it. So the next step is creating a commit. And a commit has all the things that you would usually expect, like an alter, a commit message, and then the tree that it's pointing to, and then parents. So before I said like a commit has a single parent. In Git, it's actually possible that it has more parents when you have merges, but I won't go into that for a moment. Um, so just pointing at the current commit. And then lastly, I need to update my branch to go to that new um, commit. So I get the current branch and update the target to that commit ID. So now I've changed my file um, using that save method. And eventually I'll just return the SHA or the hash of that commit. So how do you then get that file? Well, again, you get the branch, then you go to the commit, get the tree, get the file, and read the text, and then I deserialize it into an object. So that's essentially the, the two methods. Like, if you want to make this robust, there's a whole bunch of other things that you need to do. But essentially, this is what allows you to work directly with the Git database, bypassing the complete file system. So that's all nice, but you know, we're actually, um, you know, we want to use this and not rewrite this every time. So what we did is um, we built this whole thing and put in all the extra checks that are needed um, and open source this. So you can find this on GitHub and uh, you can download it, play with it. So I want to switch gears now a bit. We've seen now how you would do it. Obviously, the next question is like, why should you do it? So the first thing I mentioned in the beginning, get the schema list. You saw that we just put in JSON files. So we can modify those uh, without a problem. So if I have a user class, I can modify it to have extra properties, remove properties, whatever um, you want. Obviously, this is not um, particular to Git, any NoSQL database um, tends to have this. What's more interesting is the versioning and rollback, which is why we went down this path in the first place. So, as I showed before, I can now do a Git show of the master version of 1.json and I'll get my file back. And if I want to roll back, it's simply rolling back the branch and I get my original document back. Now, you could do that with a database, like if you have a backup and you simply roll back to that one. But this takes about a couple milliseconds. Um, if you need to restore a database from a backup, that's going to take a while. And in that time, your database is essentially offline. Or, you know, either one of the versions. So with Git, you can do this in instantly, essentially. Another cool trick is diffing your content. So what happens if in a database, you know, you have different versions uh, of rows in your, in your table? How do you then get the difference between those? Well, you'd have to build something yourself to do that. With Git, it's all built in. I can just do a Git between those two commits of one.json, and it'll tell me exactly what has changed. Um, a trick here is, I've now output the JSON onto one line, 
but if you do it in a indented format, you can actually see exactly where the things changed. So that allows you to see like what happened to my data, um, who modified it, because you get the commit messages, and you get all the exact differences uh, in your data. Backup and replication. So who's written um, some backup schemas like for SQL or Oracle, something like that? You know that it's not quite that easy. Um, first of all, things you have to do is take incremental backups. Um, you have to think about how long do you do retention of your backups. So, for example, you take daily backups, but then once they're older than a month, you only keep one. So it becomes very complicated. Now, one thing you don't need to do with Git is take incremental backups, because Git already has the complete history, and you can already roll back to any version. So you don't need that. Now, how do you do a backup? Well, you just add a remote to it, and you push all your data there. Git automatically takes care of you know, only pushing up the difference to that uh, remote repo. So and you can create multiple uh, remotes and just push them there. So we have, for example, um, our main databases on our own servers, but then we created a new GitHub repo, a private one, and just pushed up to there. And you can do that with multiple repositories and have backups all over the place with two lines of code. How do you do replication then? Well, in Git you have something like hooks. So that's a small script that runs every time you commit. So on the post commit, we just do a push backup or push replication. So that means that every time we commit to our local or our server um, repository, it immediately pushes up all of those changes to a remote repository. So that means that this script takes care of all the replication we need. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the idea is that you have one main repo, which is the only one you use to write to, and then the other ones are kind of like slaves. So if you write to both, yeah, you'll get into... You get a Yeah, uh, I mean, we wouldn't force push on our own data, no. Um, also, like, to your main repo, you actually don't push because you only write locally to it, and then you replicate it out to uh, another place. So what we've done is, uh, on top of um, a repository that sits on a server, we put a REST API on top of it. So you always write to that one, and it writes to that single repository and then you replicate it out. Another advantage are transactions. Um, and the first one are very similar to like the transactions you see in normal databases. So you can write a whole bunch of files, then update the trees with all of those files, and then you either do the commit or don't do the commit. So that's the same as in Git, adding multiple files in a, in a, sim in a single commit. So at this point, you can just do nothing, and nothing will be added. Or you can actually do the commit at that moment. And this is a atomic uh, procedure. So all the files will get added at the same time. Now, that's very similar to what you have in normal databases, so not very spectacular. What is quite nice is that you can also do long-lived transactions. And when I talk about long-lived, I talk about a transaction that lasts a week. So imagine like um, you get in some data, you do some work on Monday of adding it, then on Tuesday, then a bit more on Friday, and then, but you don't want that data inside those intermediate periods, you don't want that data to be live, rather you would build it up and then when you're done with it and you've added it, all of it, then you want to put it immediately into your um, live data as as a single atomic transaction. So you create a branch called transaction. You do a whole bunch of commits on it. Um, you know you can do whatever you want on that transaction. You can roll back, roll forward, do whatever you want. You go back to your master, and then you 
just merge it back in. And this again is an atomic transaction. So it just goes in immediately and all of your data is live in one go. So that's the good bits about it. So now let's see why you probably shouldn't do it. So I talked a lot about writing to Git, but how do you get your data back out? Because databases are read and write. So you can do queries by key or by key prefix, sort of. Now this is not very different f uh, from other key value stores. A lot of uh, NoSQL key value stores have those same properties. Um, but as before, I will go into the more Git specific things further on. So what's the solution to that? Well, if we can't read from it, then why don't we just write to it and read from somewhere else? So this is what um, you know normally is called a CQRS system, where your read and your write side are completely separate. And in our case, we've done this, where we actually write to our Git database, and that's our source of truth, and then we have a secondary uh, database where we read from. And th this is a thing that happens in a lot of um, CQRS uh, type architectures. There's one advantage here with Git is that you have commit hooks. So what we do is we just write to Git and then we have a small script that's a commit hook that then triggers a denormalization of Git into Elasticsearch in our case, but that could be SQL, that could be any other NoSQL database or data store that you want. The next thing is concurrency. So what happens if you start writing to your database um, with multiple processes at once? So what happens if we add multiple blobs at the same time? Well, that's actually fine because a blob is just um, the hash of the contents. So we can do multiple connections at the same time, writing same the same blobs, and it will be fine. There will be no concurrency conflicts with that. Now what happens when we start writing multiple trees at the same time? So let's see how that works. So the first thing I do is I copy the tree, which has a reference to blob A, and I add another one to it. Now the next thing I need to do is create a commit that points at that tree. However, because I'm in a concurrent state, what actually happens is that someone comes in and creates a new tree. It goes back to the A blob because it takes a copy of the tree A, which was there. And then it adds a blob C. So what happens is that I lose that intermediate blob. And something similar happens at the commit level. So if I create a commit, I'll point it to the previous one and I find that previous one by checking where master is pointing to. But now before I can move master forward, someone comes in and creates another commit. So I take a reference again to that one. And then when I move master, I lose my reference to that B commit. So this is not, pr not as problematic as the problem with the trees. Like if you, with the trees, if you make a mistake, well, you actually lose files. Here, the thing you lose is history. So it's still not good because I still want that history, but you don't lose the contents at least. So what's the solution? Well, locking. Um, we simply, uh, what we have done is we serialize all the writes to a single branch. So you can write concurrently to multiple branches. That's no problem because those commits and trees are all completely separate, but we do it on a branch level. And the next thing is performance. Um, we all know Git to be very fast, but I don't know about you, but I don't create a thousand commits per second when I'm writing code. When you're in a database scenario, that could happen though. So we did some tests and this is what we got to, 125 writes per second. Now, I would argue that there are definitely applications that need more than that, but there's also a lot of applications that actually don't need more than that. So when I think about 
like a wiki or a blog, no one is going to write 125 blog posts per second. So depending on your application, this could actually be sufficient. But it gets worse because this is when I have 10,000 files in my database. So what happens if I have a million files in my database? We got to 18 writes per second. Now this starts to become a little bit complicated because there's a lot of applications that are not happy with 18 writes per second. So to find the solution, first we have to know what is actually the problem. So suppose we have a um, Git repo, which has a single commit, a single tree, and then under that tree we have a million blobs. So if we write a new blob to it, so our tree looks like this. We have the hashes of 1.json up to 1 million.json. So the first thing we do is write a new blob that's as fast with one existing blob or 10 million. So that's not an issue. But now what we have to do is we have to copy the tree. So that means copying a document with a million lines. And you can see that the bigger that tree gets, the longer that copy operation is going to take. And that's why we see such a drop off in performance when we go from 10,000 to a million files. And if you go beyond that, it drops off even more. So then we add that file to it and then write a tree. So what is the solution? Um, we did a bunch of tests of that and there is multiple solutions to this. Um, all contributing a bit to the write speed. So the first thing is tree nesting. So the previous example I gave you would be a single folder with a million files. Now if you do that in Explorer or you know any file system, you also have a problem. So what's the solution there? Well, doing tree nesting. So now rather than having one tree with a million blobs, we have tree levels. So 100 times 100 times 100 is 1 million. We still have the same amount of files, we just have it nested into three subdirectories. So now if we add a file, what do we need to do? Well, we just need to update these trees. So rather than copying a single tree of a million items, we actually copy three that hold a hundred, which is a lot faster. And when we did that, we saw that for a million files, we got back up to 250 writes per second, which is actually quite good. And when I say writes per second here, what I mean is actually commits per second. Um, if you want to go even faster, um, what you could do is write multiple files in a single commit. Because we saw before that you can write files concurrently as much as you want. So if you do it that way, um, you get even to like a thousand or a thousand five hundred uh, writes per second. Um, and that depends a bit on your uh, file system as well and, and the hardware that you have below. But those numbers are actually quite decent. Um, and if you want to scale this further up, um, one thing you could do is partition. Um, so for example, if your data is partitionable, you have a database per customer or a database per country. Well, if you can get um, 250 writes per second on a single repo, then just create multiple repos that are on different disks and you can multiply your writes per second. So that's only in the case when your data is partitionable. Sometimes it isn't and you can't use this. And then another solution that you could do is change your backend. So Git um, by default writes to the file system and that's on disk drives. But um, libgit and libgit to sharp by extension has the possibility to create a different backend. So rather than writing to the file system, you write into a Redis or a Memcache, Elastic, um, and you could add to that because it's a plugin system. And that means that uh, you can actually scale out uh, your GitDB over multiple uh, servers that automatically index the bits of it. One particular disadvantage here is that um, with a normal and regular uh, disk-based uh, Git repository, 
I could just simply remote into the machine and run the git commands on that. If it's an elastic search, for example, I don't have that possibility anymore. I would have to always pull the data and work on it remotely. Then merge conflicts. So very often your merges go like this and everything's happy. Uh, and then you have these ones. Um, and it's a real problem. And the solution, we don't really have one. Um, so what happens if you have like a merge conflict of 10,000 files? How, how do you solve something like that? What we do is simply um, make sure that we work in separate areas of our data. So our data is uh, geographical data, and we make sure that you know you only work on regions in a branch. So for example, I would work, or my colleagues would work on the London region, someone else in Manchester, and that way we assure that there is no data conflict. We have had some conflicts though, uh, when people didn't listen and still did it. In that case, um, one of the solutions that we thought about was, well, if we have a merge conflict, rather than solving it at that moment, why don't we just commit the entire merge conflict? And then when you read it, you can actually say like, hey, we have a merge conflict in our database. Here are the two different versions. And then present to the user, which one do you want? It has a lot of complications as well. Um, because what do you do if you know, you're an end user and you just want to see the data and you don't know which one is right. So there are some problems there and you have to be careful with this when you start creating a lot of branches. So when do I think um, using Git as a database is a good idea? It's mostly with content heavy applications. So for example, a CMS or a wiki, um, for example, on GitHub, I don't know if you've used the wiki feature there. Um, you can pull, pull those wikis down, and it's actually a Git repository on the back. So they're actually already using Git as a database as well. And that works perfectly fine for these, because you don't have all the issues you normally have um, when you have lots of writes, because no one is going to create thousands of wiki posts in, in, in seconds. And another um, good opportunity is when your data is partitionable. So even if you have like a high write requirement, you need to put a lot of writes in at the same time. As long as your data is partitionable, you can still do that. You just create different repositories and you multiply your write speed by the repo. When should you not use this? Well, as I said, when you need fast writes. If your data is not partitionable and you need to do 5,000 writes per second, then don't use this because it's not going to scale up to that. And another problem is immediate consistency. Um, so as I said before, like if you want to do queries, well, you're going to have to denormalize into a read store. Now, it's fairly fast to do that. Um, when you do a commit, it typically takes like half a second, a second before those changes are then replicated in your data store, depending a bit on what the change is. But you do have some eventual consistency there. Um, so that happens in a lot of systems. Um, if you use Git as your primary data source, well, you won't have immediate consistency. So let's have a quick look at the demo. 